Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the, um, the power of your word, God. Even though uh, we think we know what needs to be done in our lives, we're so appreciative, God, that you know even more. And God, no matter what, um, no matter what you want to do, we want to let you. So Lord, may we hear the message that you have for us, not the one that I have, not the one that we want or we think we need, but, but may you make the changes in our lives that, that you want to make, God. As your word says, show me your word that I may walk in your truth. Show me your word. God, please give us eyes to see, ears to hear the wondrous things. We love you, God, and we need you, and, and we know that. When we're not afraid nor ashamed. Um, we know how badly we need you. So please be with us, because your word says so. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Psalm 111 and Psalm 112 are kind of like bookends. First of all, I want you to know that they are what's called acrostic poems. Does anybody know what an acrostic poem is? Acrostic poems mean every line begins with a letter in the alphabet coinciding, um, preceding. So in, in our language is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so forth and so on. So every f set of verses will begin with a letter. So for instance, Psalm 111 verse 1, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. And then the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. Now, in the Hebrew, where this is written in, it's Aleph, Beth, and Adele, whatever. It goes in the same um, co corresponding letter of the condescension of the alphabet itself. You guys understand that? Now, what, does anybody know what the most popular acrostic poem in, in the uh, Psalms is? Psalm 119. That's 170 some odd verses, and every eight verses starts with the letters. As a matter of fact, Psalm 119 actually lays it out for you. We're going to get to that in a couple of, in a couple of um, weeks, obviously. But it'll actually lay it out where it'll say Aleph, and then everyone starts in the original language. Now, I didn't know this until I started to study for this, but. I guess I should have known it. The other acrostic poems in the Psalms are Psalm 9 and 10, Psalm 25, Psalm 34, Psalm 37, Psalm 111, Psalm 112, which we're doing tonight, Psalm 119, Psalm 145 is also an acrostic poem. And then Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, is also in the acrostic style of, um, of poetry. Who knew? Now, the only thing I would add to that, just um, from the perspective of a personal thing, is I think that's a really cool exercise to try and do. One day, write a poem to God and start one line with the letter A. The next line with the letter B. The next line with the letter C, so forth and so on. Try to do that and see how interesting it is. See how your mind can not just, um, not just expand to worship God in a new way, but also to find some creativity towards something that maybe you never found creativity to. I, um, if you guys don't know part of my testimony, is I moved down to Florida in 1988. And the reason I moved down to Florida is because there was a, a burgeoning um, music scene down here. And I wanted to be a part of, of music. I wanted to be a musician. So I moved down here and I joined a rock and roll band and I became um, a local musician down here. And um, I was uh, a real, I, I, I loved writing poetry. So I have literally probably two or three dozen books. You ever see those little binder books with the little loopy metal things? I still got them in a, in a, in a, um, a briefcase. I've probably got two dozen books filled with poetry. And it, the craziest thing is, I look back at that poetry. I can look back at the poetry that I wrote from some 25, 30 years ago, and it's pretty dark and depressing. And do you know when I stopped writing poetry? When I got saved. It's a weird thing. Now, I don't know if, if it was a dark spirit upon me that I channeled into, which if you read some of the stuff, you'd think it was. Or I never really tried to be creative toward God. That the most important thing in my life back then was being creative toward me. 
and everything was about my feelings and my emotions. It's like the craziest thing. There's a, um, if you know the band Korn, how many of you guys grew up in the 80s and 90s? There's a band called Korn. The um, Brian Wellish is the uh, guitar player and, the, and, and was a uh, main songwriter. Well, he got radically saved and left his band. And um, you'll hear him talk about that also. It was very hard for him to write songs after that because the kind of spirit of angst was gone. That misery from his heart was, was, has disappeared. He actually has a band now, I think it's still out, called The Whosoever's. I don't know their music at all, but he seems to be serious about the things of the Lord still. I, I know that he's been touring with Corn again, but maybe he needed money. I don't know. I don't want to judge the guy. Anyway, so try to do that. Now, i tell you what else I've done. You guys I know have been around the church for any length of time. I talk about a lot of times where when I run out of things to pray, because I always love to pray, but I just seem to, I don't know if you're like me, I run out of things to say to God sometimes. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, uh, I want to pray, but and if I don't get to work by 11, I'm going to be really busy, and i got a lot of orders to pack today, and Austin's not there. What am I doing? Right. And I lose track of my thoughts and I, I want to wander into my own personal thing. So what I do sometimes is I'll do acrostic worship to God. I'll go through the alphabet and like, I'll just want to sit and worship you, God, because you're deserving of worship. God, you're amazing. You're uh, a wonderful God. You're uh, a, a awesome God. You're awesome. You're a... a you guys are not, you're not following this thing here. Almighty, Almighty God, you're B. You're, you're beautiful. You're, you're yeah. benevolent. Alpha. benevolent. Alpha. We're in the B. You're late. Late to the game, Jack. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's how you could spend. All of a sudden you don't realize it, but 15, 20 minutes of your life has passed and all has been filled with is worshiping God. Your mind completely focused on him. And it's a... Uh, not a waste of time at all. You guys understand what I'm saying there? So give those things a try, and, and that's just the commentary on the acrostic style. However, reading the psalm, starting from verse 1 again, praise the Lord. These begin what's called the praise psalms again. I mean, continuing in the praise psalms. Uh, the next few psalms all start with the word hallelujah. Hallelujah, the uh, Hebrew word hallelujah, which means anybody? Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and the congregation. Guys, I've been confronted with a few people of late who seem to think that you do not need to go to church to be a Christian. And I addressed this a little bit on Sunday, but I will have you to know, if anybody is here or at home watching, please get back to church. The COVID scare is over. It's over. Don't let the government tell you different, okay? It's over. They have treatments now if you have it. They have inoculations before you get it. Most people are living. It, the, the survival rate, even though the infection rate is high, the survival rate is way past 99.99%. Please come back to church. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. David in the Psalms, the Lord Jesus went to temple for goodness sakes. We all have got to get into church and stay in church, not just for what you get, but also for what you give. There's people here that need your love. Now, um, Sister Elizabeth is here with us, her and her husband Tanner. Um, they, uh, he pastors a church in California. And they, you guys, if you're here on Sunday, we prayed for them. And, and they said everything went good and the cops didn't show up, right? They're told by their local government not to do church. We're not. We're not. Man, let's take advantage of the fact that we're in a state whose, whose governor is actually claims to be a Christian and who believes that the, the right given us in the, uh, in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, let's not forsake the gathering of the brethren as is the manner of some. So much the more as we see the day approaching. Hear what he says, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Where? In the assembly of the upright and the congregation. Guys, I sit in that office all the time with couples, and the first thing I say to them every time, I throw my hands and I go, you go to church once a month. What do you expect? I mean, how do you think you're going to hold things together? 
Your relationship began in church. How could it not continue in church? You come here, you find a spouse, we do this thing, and I tell you all the time how important it is. Why don't you? Oh, well, life, job, kids. Listen to what I tell you, congregation. You stop going to church, your life's going to fall apart, period. I don't care if it's here. If you think this is a pitch to come to church here, it ain't. We got money in the bank right now. Next few months are paid to rent. Go anywhere. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Now, if you give credit to David for this psalm, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who take pleasure in them. When you read the book of Genesis and you see the firsts of all the things, the, um, we talked about the, um, the premise of first mention. All of the first, the first time the word grace appears, the first time the word mercy appears, the first time, all these things that you find, you study these things because his works are great. And then you could pattern your life on, well, if God did that for them, surely he will do it for me. God's word will not be broken. He will not break his word. He will not break his promise. The promises of God are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. We might go through the valleys, but he always takes us to the mountaintop. And then we're going to get kicked off that mountaintop again and go into the valley, but we're always going to wind up in the end on that mountaintop. That's a promise. Do you believe that? Listen, I could say the same thing that David said. Look, I was old. I was young. Now I'm old. I've not seen the righteous forsaken. I've not seen him forsaken. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. Now, you can read Psalm um, 111, verse 2 through 6, through the eyes of David, who is studying the works of the Lord. He's reading through the book of Genesis, and he's going, man, God made Adam, and then he gave him a mate. God's going to bring me a mate. God made Joseph, and he got, he got arrogant and full of himself, so he had to get knocked down off his pedestal by his brothers, but God took him out of the pit. And he, you could read through this thing, and all of the things that God did in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, for the patriarchs. And that's just exactly what he, he's saying here. Man, the works of the Lord are great. His work's honorable and glorious. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He's thinking about the people that have been forgiven and the people he rescued. You think about Abraham and Isaac going up on the hill. But Father, where is the, where is the ram for the sacrifice? God will provide himself the lamb. I mean, he's reading it and retelling it. He's describing what he's read, and so should we. The works of the Lord are great. Man, it's, the Bible is so rich. I cannot tell you. One of my, the biggest pleasures of my life is me and Jonas some years ago worked together when he was just a, a wee lad. And he was kind of a, a wild young, young man in his teens. And he kind of left and, and kind of did his own thing for a while. And then some months later, I was talking to his mother, and his mother said, you know, all Jonah does is stay around and read the Bible all day long. He's fallen in love with that book. That's all he does. He reads the Bible night and day. And there's something about when you hear that, then he's going to be all right. He's going to be all right. I heard this story about people who don't think Christianity means anything. So you're this person, you're walking, down an, uh, uh, you're walking down a dark alley and you see three people walking your way. Does it change your mind at all to think, or should I say to know, that those people just walked out of a Bible study? 
course it does. He's going to be all right. Doggone it, he is. Proud of you, son. He has given food to those who fear him. The, the, the Israelites in the desert, the quail and the manna, he's given food. He has ever declared to his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. He gave them the land. He let some of them stay on one side of Jordan, the other on the other side of the Jordan. The works of his hands of verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. That word for verity, it just means truth. But it's like solid truth, verity. It's like, oh, that's truth. Is that truth? No, that's truth, truth. That's verity and truth. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Verse 10 occurs, that, that phrase occurs some 20 or 30 times in the Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's so crazy because I remember being in the world, and I don't tell me if you guys relate to this, and I used to hear people say about the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And in my arrogance, listen, if God needs me to be afraid of him, for me to love him, got the wrong guy because I ain't afraid of nobody and nothing. Why should I be fear and tremble before the Lord? Does anybody just show hands? Am I alone in that one? Same thing, right? It's just the craziest thing. And I realized, you know what? I, I was really stupid back then. I thought I was street smart. I promised myself, man, when I raise my son, someday I'm going to grow up and I'm going to have a son and I'm going to raise him. He's going to be street smart. I'm going to write down all the lessons I learned. I'm going to write them all down and I'm going to tell them, listen, when you're walking down the street, don't let anybody come in. You watch this here. Keep your money backward. I'm going to write all these lessons. We teach you how to shoot at a young age because if you got it, you know, all these things. And then when I got saved, when I got serious about the things of the Lord, I just wanted an innocent kid without any street smarts whatsoever. Just, just be innocent. Just don't know nothing about the street. It's just, it's nothing. You guys understand what I'm saying? The day I decided to fear the Lord is the day I began the wisdom of my life. If you're here and you don't understand the fear of the Lord, the Bible so clearly says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way. That's what it is to fear the Lord. Psalm 112, the book end, another praise. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Did you guys hear that promise? I wanted to have a kid to grow up to be street smart. Here, the Bible says, listen, you want your kid to be mighty on the earth? Listen to this one. The meek shall inherit the earth. Meek, listen to me. Listen to me. A lot of things I've been in my life. Meek ain't never been one of them. I've got meek children. All my kids are meek. It's beautiful. They are. They're humble before God. They're so opposite their Heavenly Father and so much more like their... Did I say opposite? They're so opposite their earthly father and so much like their Heavenly Father. And they pity me because they know I'm not meek. I'm not mild. And they just... Dad... You want to know the honest answer to that question? She asked the question, how do you teach a kid to be meek in a fallen world? I'm going to tell you how you teach him. Well, 
you fall short in that? And you sit next to somebody that don't? Anybody? In the, any proximity? We all do, sister. Every one of us falls short. But here's how I have raised kids in this world. And I'm going to tell you, this is, to me, the most important thing. It's not the witness that I have in the world or in business or even with my wife. It's the witness that I have that every day they see me going to the Lord. My kids have never, you ask any of my kids, they've never, ever seen me not go to the Lord every day. Even in the worst of times, I am every day in the Word. I can honestly say this. I have never taken my beliefs and shoved them down my kid's throat. I've just lived them in front of them the best that I could. And what that has done is even when my children were um, apart from me, even when they wanted to rebel against me, they always held it against me and never against God. Do you understand that? My kids always knew they can come back to the Lord at any point in time they wanted because I never, ever used my belief as a, as, a, as a butcher knife against them. I always just lived it out. You don't want to walk with the Lord, that's fine, but here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to church with us because if you don't have enough respect to spend an hour and a half with us once a week, look, I, my, some of my, you know, I got a couple of kids that haven't walked with the Lord their whole life. They've strayed away or walked away and, you know, and who knows where their hearts are? You don't know. But I never, ever, ever used God against them. I never judged them in their sin. You, you, is it, am I making sense to you, Chrissy? Just go to God every day. Let them see your devotion to the Lord. And it doesn't matter what's going on in your house. They'll see your devotion to the Lord. Oh, Aina? Would you add anything to that? What, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? Why are you walking with the Lord? When, I mean, Elena, I, I got saved and she was just a little girl. So she had five, six, seven years of her life where I wasn't saved. And believe me, wasn't saved is, is being kind. I'd say I was working for the enemy. What, what, why didn't you ever turn your back on God? I love you, baby. <sighs> Wealth and riches will be in his house, and righteousness endures forever. Well, there's another great promise. Now, I know the name it and claim it preachers might want to take that verse and bastardize it. But listen, if you follow the Lord and follow his ways and precepts, you're going to be a great worker. And you'll climb the ladder in any corporation, any company you'll be. And I can't guarantee that God's not going to take from me. God did. For 10 years, God took everything me and my wife had. But I can sit here and tell you right now, he's restored that and then some. God owes me nothing. If he took every dime I had, I've already had a better run than most people have their whole lives. I got no complaints. You follow what I'm saying? Anybody? God will make you a better employee. And you want to know the crazy thing is, too? So you think about us in America saying that. But what about the people in countries where they are poor? What about communist countries? What about African countries where, where money is? Let me tell you something. If you rely on God for everything, even what little you have will be riches to you. You'll have no complaints. You'll be able to say, give us this day our daily bread. That much I know. I've met a lot of people in other countries. Continuing, unto the upright there arises a light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Don't underestimate verse 4, guys. There are so many promises here you have to see. And again, being acrostic, it's kind of crazy because he does this weird thing where he hits a bunch of different subjects at once. Boing, boing, boing. He's bouncing around. But each one of them is so full of riches. Listen to me. 
Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Have you ever been in such a terrible place? Maybe you had a terrible fight with your spouse or a terrible, you did something stupid on the road and this darkness falls over you. The enemy is there to tell you, look at you. Look at what you did. I know what you did. And the enemy just, and there's this little flicker of light in that darkness. Crazy thing about light and darkness. You know, they say that um, darkness I don't remember the saying, darkness is the absence of light, not the... You go in the bathroom, turn the lights off, it's dark. You light a match, it's light. It don't work the other way around. You can't throw darkness at light. Light shines above darkness. And that's why in a world so dark, it just takes a tiny spark of the love of God, a tiny spark of light to just give you that much hope and starts to shine the way. When the world wants to judge you and you want to judge yourself and you're feeling your, your own conviction, man, just, just here's the promise. There arises light in the darkness. You know why? Because he's gracious, full of compassion and righteous. It reminds me of that verse. You know, the Bible says, God knows our frame, that we are but dust. He knows you're just a bunch of puffed up dirt, as my pastor used to say. Don't be so hard on yourself, man. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. I don't like that verse much. Don't come to me for money, I don't have any. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. Man, there's so many stories I can tell you about that. The crazy things that God has done. People who swore to kill me when I left my neighborhood. You know, if we ever see you again, you're dead. I understand. And how God, so many stories. You guys, some of you guys have heard them. Another, another study. There's a great Bible verse, and it's in the book of Proverbs. I think it's in the book of Proverbs. Yeah, it is. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Who makes his enemy? Who makes it? God makes even your enemies to be at peace with you when your ways please the Lord. What an amazing promise. Amazing. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Guys, verse 10 is so prophetic. Do you know, in the book of Revelation, the Bible uh, describes the end times where the flesh will fall out of people and their eyes will melt out of their socket. And the description is as such, as you can't think, it's like, oh, that's horrible, but it is the exact description of what happens in a, uh, an atom bomb, huh? Radiation. It's, it's, and here... Because the Bible says that when the wicked, you think about, if you're watching TV now and you see all the arguments about, about socialism and communism and, and the fighting back and forth between the political parties, and, and they're all full of it, each one of them. There. You think to yourself, what is it going to take for this guy to wake up? What is it going to take for this chick to get it? And then you read the Bible. The Bible says that, you know, in the end times, people will bite their tongue out of their mouth rather than confess Jesus is Christ. They will hide in the mountains and beg the rocks to fall on them. They will seek death and not find it. And you know what? Up till just a couple years ago, I couldn't see that. I see it now. I see it. Like, what do you need? Verse 10, 
Chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter 113 of the book of Psalms. Psalm 113. Hallelujah, or praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all the nations. His glory above the heavens. Who is like our God who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? You know what I call this? I will write in my Bible, proper perspective. When your problems are big, it's because you realize that your God is small. But when your God is big, it don't matter what problem comes your way, it shall become small. Pastor uh, Don Dukes, and you all remember Don Dukes? He used to have this saying, Don Dukes, you have to talk like this. He's a woman, a little southern guy. He's a little skinny black dude. And he used to say, oh, man. So you, you come to my office and you say to me, you know, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm under circumstances. The first thing I want to tell you, what you doing up under them circumstances? Get out, go, get out from under them circumstances. Who told you to get under them circumstances? Don Dukes was the best. Oh, I miss that dude. Oh, did he pour his life into me. Praise the Lord. Praise, O oh servants of the Lord. Praise his, Did anybody, do, you old Calvary, what, Lord, do you remember this song? Clay wrote this song, and that, and that uh, I remember that blonde girl used to sing it. No, Amy who? Oh, she was Amy too? What was the name of that, that girl that used to sing the song that had this, the most amazing heavenly voice, but then she moved away? Huh? Letty, is that her name? She sang that song, King of Kings, right? This woman would sing. Let me tell you something. It would take your heart and just put it in God's throne. This was a great song. There's another song after this, uh, after this psalm. It's, uh, Who is like our God? Anybody know that song from um, Holy and Intimate? Precious and kind. And then there's a verse in the song, my favorite verse in the whole song. No fallen angel is worthy to be worshipped, nor anything created. And that song would rise. Who? No, I'm alone on this. <laughs> the Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like our God who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. And verse 9 is a verse that some women... I started the psalm and you knew where I was going. Some of you ladies here, maybe some that are not here, it's a promise you hold on to. You can't wait for it to be fulfilled or you've seen it fulfilled. I'm thinking of a couple of women in my head and as soon as I say it, he grants the barren woman a home like the joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, if you, um, if you don't know the plight of a barren woman, the Bible says that the, the womb that has never bore children is always yearning. If you're a lady here and you've never bore a child through circumstances or medical problems, hold on to your promise. And if you're a woman here that has bore many children, Share. <laughs> Share. They're ready, right? Have one. Take one anytime. <gasps> I love this verse. When the world says there's no hope, even in Christian circles, when you're looked down upon, frowned upon, he grants the barren woman a home. A 
home. What does that mean? Like, oh, I got a place for you, sister. I love that verse. Like a joyful mother of children, praise the Lord. And then last psalm we're going to study tonight. We have time. Psalm 114. Psalm 114, they call the, the um, Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian hal- halal, or the Egyptian hallelujah. This is like the only psalm in the entire Bible that speaks directly toward the um, Exodus. When the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt, the psalm writer wrote this like, like we read in Psalm 111, after reading it and reading the works of the Lord. It is such a quirky, funny thing. There's almost this... It's like a, a hilarious... Ah, sarcasm. Listen to this psalm. It's so, it's so cute. It, it's a cute psalm. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. You guys know the story. If you don't, Moses is leading the people. Pharaoh says, you know what? I, may, I changed my mind again. Go kill them all. And they get on their horses and they're riding and the children of Israel are freaking out. On one side of them is the army. On the other side of them is the river, the Red Sea. Stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. But did you know that's not the first time he did that? He split the Jordan. He split the Red Sea. He split a few seas, as a matter of fact. And now look how the psalm writer writes this. Before you read verse 4, read verse 5. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back. What, 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 what happened to the sea? What, what happened? What, what happened? What happened to you? It's, it's this weird thing. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, the mountains skip like rams, and the little hills like lambs. And then in verse 6, he says, Oh, mountains, that you skip like rams. Oh, little hills like lambs. What, what happened to you? What, what happened? What did you see? Do tell us. Did you get afraid of something? What, what, what happened there? And then he describes it. He says, Tremble. O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water and the flint into a fountain of waters. What power. What power. If you've not read that and you don't know what that psalm writer is talking about, man, I encourage you, read the book of Exodus. Start tonight and see the amazing things that God did and remembering or reminding yourself, there's a great line in the, in, in the movie Lord of the Rings. It said, history, I'm, I'm going to screw it up. History became legend. Legend became myth. And some things that should never have been forgotten were forgotten. Don't ever, ever abandon. We read no fables. We believe in no myth. The history of Israel is our history. It is his history. It is his story. Lest we forget that what God did for them, he wants to do for us. In the same way he parted the Red Sea, the Jordan, the same way he rescued the people of Israel, the same way he wants to, that he used them mightily to fill them with their spirit, he wants to do the same for us. The Bible says this, the Lord Jesus doing speaking, all things are possible to him who believes. Whatever you ask in prayer believing, it shall be done for you. I was young, 
and now mold. For I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. I don't know where you're at tonight, but there's a heaviness in the room. There's a heaviness, a, a broken heartedness, a loss of hope I sense from some. And I'm telling you right now, read the book of Exodus. God wants to put you on a road out of your misery, out of your Egypt. He wants to bring you out into what the Bible calls rich fulfillment. Read those Psalms over later on. It's a five minute read. And, and receive your promise. Light in the darkness. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your Psalms. We thank you so much for the writers of these Psalms. We thank you so much for the history, the works of the Lord of verity and truth. We believe it, God. This is truth. This is not myth nor legend. God, we thank you so much. And I pray, whoever here is losing hope, God, I pray you'd fill them again with a hope that does not disappoint. A belief that you will finish what you started. A belief that you are mightier than the breakers of the sea, the waves of the ocean, what happened to you, O oh, sea, that you fled back? What happened, hills and mountains that you skipped like rams? Stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. Tremble, O oh, earth, at the sound of the Lord. God, I pray over this congregation and my own heart as well. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Make it so in our lives, God, please. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.